So this is a part of the conference that we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on because uh, it shows you that medicine is indeed an art and not a science. That there not only is not always is one correct answer, and there often uh, often is differences of opinion. Um, but what we hope to illustrate through these case presentations is to reiterate some of the points that have been made today, and also try to cover points that uh, we didn't have time to cover during the didactic sessions. So if I can have the first slide. Okay. Yeah. So um, before I begin, many of you have approached me a little bit concerned about my he health and I'm a little bit red in the face, wondering whether I might have high blood pressure. I assure you that's not the case. This is what I've been doing the last couple of days. I was in, uh, at the Masters Tournament in Augusta, Georgia with my son. A unbelievable experience. He's taller than you. I know he is. <laughs> that's okay, I just say sit down so I can slap you. Okay, so let's begin. So we have a 68-year-old white female who presents with right-sided abdominal pain. She has a past medical history significant for hypertension, past surgical history significant for hysterectomy. She has a bone scan, MRI of the brain, which is negative. She has some anemia, but otherwise her labs are within normal limits. And you can see here she has a locally advanced tumor involving the right kidney. There's evidence of a renal vein, an IVC thrombus, so the tumor is growing out of the renal vein into the inferior vena cava. And she has bilateral pulmonary nodules. There's one there, there's one there, one there. So now, just a little bit about the rules. I know you, there are a lot of things you could do. I want to know what you would do specifically for each case. So let's start, let's see. Dr. Karam, what would you recommend for this patient and why? So uh, the patient have any uh, reason to get an MRI brain or bone scan or assume or that's negative? That so I think the patient needs surgery. Uh, the question is, should she also enroll in a clinical trial? And so that's something we would discuss with the patient, assuming that these there's the lesions in the lung are metastatic and you know measurable. And she would ultimately need the radical nephrectomy and IVC thrombectomy. So that would be your upfront maneuver you would offer this patient, a right radical nephrectomy with IVC thrombectomy? Yes. OK, and then, when, and then, then what? Well, if the patient's on a certain trial, she will get the drug for that trial. Uh, if not, then... Suppose she's not on a clinical trial, what would you do? I would refer her to Dr. Gao, Dr. Tenier, or Dr. Yonesh. Okay, what time would you refer her at? At uh, about four to six weeks after I've seen the patient, after uh, the patient's recovered from surgery, uh, if she did not go on a clinical trial. Okay, and if suppose Dr. Uh, Gao, Dr. Tenier, and Dr. Yonesh are unavailable, what treatment would you recommend? Uh, sunitinib or pizopinib. Okay, fair enough. Um, if, assuming this is clear cell and all the other stuff. But. Dr. Uh, Dr. Gao, what would you recommend and why? So, um, you know, Dr. Karam actually mentioned clinical trial. Can you guys hear me? So now speak up. Bring the microphone uh, closer. So, um, I don't know how big the lung lesions are. If they are over one centimeter, this patient can be a, a good candidate for, for the clinical trial I just talked about. So, so they, are, they are over one centimeter. So you would enroll the patient in a clinical trial? Uh, yeah, so this patient can clearly get you know, either nivolumab or nivolumab plus ipilimumab or nivolumab plus um, bevacizumab. And uh, if, he hadn't re if she hadn't response, uh, has the stable disease before surgery, after that you can continue uh, nivolumab as maintenance therapy. So that will be one option if, if she's a candidate for Okay, so you, you would recommend pre-surgical therapy with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I think that's a reasonable choice. That would be your first choice? Uh, in the, I mean, if we want to learn about the biology of, uh, of this patient and her cancer, so I think that will be my first choice. Okay. And suppose the biopsy didn't come back as, came back as non-clear cell, came back as, let's say, papillary, what would you recommend? Uh, if it's papillary, unfortunately, uh, she will not be qualified for, for that clinical trial. Right. So what would you recommend? So uh, I would go with doc, doc, what Dr. Graham said. Um, we'll do surgery first. So you would advocate cytoreductive nephrectomy for non-clear cell histology? Um, I um, I think that the data for uh, non-clear cell is not that clear-cut. Um, 
So, uh, but for a patient with, uh, with, you know, with symptoms and also with, uh, uh, with thrombosis, with anemia, so uh, I think, you know, uh, if you take out the primary tumor, potentially this patient can benefit clinically. So the, just for the audience's sake, there's a controversy in the literature about whether or not patients who have non-clear cell histology should undergo <laughs> cytoreductive nephrectomy. Uh, there are conflicting reports in the literature. Some say it benefits, some say it does not benefit. Uh, and so it's always an issue that we go round and round about whether or not patients with non-clear cell histology should have that surgery because you can see from the slides that the vast majority of the tumor burden would be removed by taking out the patient's kidney and the IVC thrombus. That said, patients with non-clear cell histology who have evidence of venous involvement, it's almost uniformly fatal. So this patient, if that were non-clear cell, is not going to do very well. Um, Eric, do you have anything to add? No, just uh, if, if this is papillary, uh, then the idea of trying a MET inhibitor sooner rather than later, and especially on a clinical trial, we're about to open a papillary renal cell carcinoma trial with a MET inhibitor. That would be an ideal venue for this individual. So the patient ultimately underwent cytoreductive nephrectomy, and we included this patient in the ADAPT trial. That was a trial that I showed during my cytoreductive nephrectomy talk where patients are randomized to an de uh, autologous dendritic cell-based vaccine plus sunitinib versus sunitinib alone. You can see the pathology from the um, resection. All right, let's move on. So this is a 23-year-old African-American uh, male who presents with gross hematuria and flank pain, has no past medical or past surgical history. The pain was alleviated with non-steroidals like Motrin or Advil or one of those. Uh, as a side note, he just graduated from Yale University with a degree in business. All of his labs are within normal limits except for some mild anemia. And so the, the presumptive diagnosis by the emergency room is that he has a kidney stone and they do a stone protocol CT which they tell him is negative. So Dr. Mateen, if you were to see this patient with this imaging and this story, what would you recommend and why? So for the purposes of the audience, a stone protocol CT means that there is no contrast given. There's no intravenous contrast. There's no oral contrast. So it doesn't take a trained eye to look at the scan to see that everything's sort of gray and fuzzy. You can't really make out much. You know, the only thing you can really tell is that there's no kidney stone. So with, with the, uh, the gross hematuria, meaning that there's visible blood in the urine, he needs a contrast-enhanced study, CT of the abdomen, and pelvis. Okay, anything else? Would you do cystoscopy? Yeah, I would, I would do a, a, a workup for hematuria, which includes looking in the bladder, but okay. that's likely to be higher up. Dr. Karam, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, just agree with Dr. Mateen on this one. Okay, so the pain persisted, as did uh, intermittent gross hematuria, and the patient sought numerous medical consultations, and as a consequence of those consultations, it was found out that he's sickle cell trait positive, and a CT with IV contrast was finally obtained five months from his initial presentation. Now, all this went on outside MD Anderson, by the way. And uh, he had a CT chest bone scan, MRI of the brain, all of which was negative. And here's the scan. So, um, Dr. Tanir, what's your presumptive diagnosis and what would you recommend for this patient? I think this patient uh, fits the criteria for the diagnosis of renal medullary carcinoma. These are patients who are young African-American and have sickle cell trait. And invariably, the vast majority, 95% of them, present with either metastatic disease or locally advanced disease. Unfortunately, this is a disease that the drugs I talked about today, uh, the target therapies, don't work. And therefore, um, this patient should have a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And uh, in uh, our opinion, uh, patients with this diagnosis, even if they don't have metastatic disease to visceral organs, uh, when they present with uh, local region disease like this patient has with bulky lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum, they should uh, receive systemic therapy. The only therapy that we have uh, uh, noted uh, that helps uh, control the disease for a while is cytotoxic chemotherapy. So this patient would have a biopsy to confirm that this is real medullary carcinoma. I would treat them with cytotoxic chemotherapy up front. 
hopefully the patient will respond, and then I, w I will refer him uh, to you or to uh, Jose or Serena for uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy and removing all visible disease with the hope that if we can convert him into no evidence of disease status, uh, we will continue chemotherapy postoperatively, and hopefully there is a chance that this patient could survive uh, past two years. Just to show the audience the x-ray, so this is the tumor, sort of an infiltrative tumor involving the right kidney, and then these big lumps here, there's one here, and there's one here. This is all lymph, uh, enlarged lymph nodes that are involved by the cancer. And so, um, would you biopsy the lymph node or the primary tumor? I think either one. Uh, there is, uh, you could get the diagnosis with either one, whichever is uh, amenable to surgery. I think the, the lymph nodes are big enough to stick a needle there, but I think the kidney is fine. Would uh, anybody on the panel advocate uh, upfront surgery? No. So, Thanks for that. Okay. So biopsy did indeed reveal that it was a renal medullary carcinoma, uh, poorly differentiated. The patient went on to receive five cycles of chemotherapy with paclitaxel and carboplatin. So, Nazar, you want to comment on that regimen? Yeah, I think uh, we, th we are still treating these uh, uh, patients with cytotoxics uh, uh, using the same regimens we use for bladder cancer, basically, uh, uh, or transition carcinoma of the upper tract. So, this is a regimen that uh, the uh, um, advantage of using the, this combination is that we know if the patient is going to have surgery, they're going to lose their kidney. So uh, it is important to use combinations that uh, uh, have less toxicity on the kidney. So avoiding cisplatin, and that's why I think you know the, the tax, uh, paclitaxel and carboplatin would be a good regimen. And we have. Uh, seen many patients have actually, I would say, uh, probably around 50 percent, 40 or 50 percent of these patients will respond to this regimen. How common is it? How common is this cancer? This is a very, very, very rare cancer. In fact, I think uh, in the literature there are uh, fewer than 50 uh, patients diagnosed. But I have to say that it's probably a lot of it is uh, not talked about because. Uh, there is a lack of awareness. People don't think about this disease. They think it's just kidney cancer, and they'll treat it like any kidney cancer. I think the uh, important thing here for patients, their families, as well as providers, surgeons, nurses, it's, and medical oncologists, is when they see a patient who has, who is African American, who is young, and the 95 percent of these patients are African Americans, or. Africans uh, who are in the U.S., but this is a diagnosis that uh, is common, actually, in uh, large countries with large uh, African uh, descent patients. So uh, I think with uh, more awareness, and we've seen that when we started uh, uh, to get interested in doing research on this uh, aggressive uh, disease uh, that's rare, that all of a sudden we have we are. Uh, hearing more and more about it from different states, different cities with large African-American populations where, you know, patients are diagnosed. So I think we don't, nobody knows the exact incidence because, again, uh, it's, a lot of it is uh, uh, put in the column of kidney cancer. But I think, you know, if we uh, go back and look at all patients, you know, who had kidney cancer, who were African-American young, and had sickle cell trait, the, the, the incidence uh, would, would be higher than it's been reported. So we were able to uh, compile a series of about 50 patients now over the past 10 years, mostly treated here at MD Anderson, and, and I would say probably half of those we have seen over the last two or three years here at MD Anderson. Um, I think it, this remains a unif uniformly fatal disease, unfortunately, with a median survival of only one year, despite initial uh, response in many of these patients with uh, cytotoxics. Um, we are uh, conducting uh, molecular uh, research on these tumors as well as immune research. And this is a disease where if you harvest the kidney, um, whether it's before or after cytotoxics, you'll find immune infiltrates. So that suggests that there is an attempt by the tumor by the body to mount an immune response. So uh, an exciting thing would be to treat these patients in the very near future 
with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, which hopefully will add to uh, the uh, very modest uh, benefit of cytotoxic chemotherapy. And one of the other benefits is that uh, as a consequence of uh, uh, doing cytoreductive surgery on these patients, we've been able to establish a model in the laboratory which will, again, further allow us to evaluate different therapies that might be effective in the setting. But the challenge has been, because it is such a rare disease uh, in African Americans, that, uh, you know, to try and develop a standard therapy has been a real challenge. Uh, Chris, if you don't mind, before we move on to this case, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, two ladies who are uh, mounting a very uh, noble, uh, campaign to try to raise the level of awareness of this disease. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ritchie and uh, Mrs. Uh, Cora uh, Connor. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ritchie Johnson lost her son, unfortunately, a few years ago to this disease after a, a valiant fight of 15 months. And Cora, uh, we're happy that her, her brother is a cancer survivor and he's three years out from the initial diagnosis with a complete response. I think they're doing great work, in, if you're interested. Uh, Mrs. Johnson has uh, a pamphlet. She established a foundation. Both of them are patient advocates. That's why I'm uh, uh, identifying, them in, identifying them in the audience so that uh, um, people will know about the great job they're doing. So hopefully we will, we are in the process of forming an alliance Renal Medullary Carcinoma Alliance for Patients and uh, uh, Patient Advocates to try to uh, increase the level of awareness of this and of, obviously also to try to increase funding for this very aggressive cancer that's extremely unfunded where industry unfortunately uh, is not, uh, uh, doesn't have trials for these patients with these very rare tumors. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So, Serena, here's the response after five cycles of chemotherapy. What would you recommend at this point? Yeah, that's a great response, you know, and it's... Um, Can you talk in the microphone? Yeah, it's a great response. You know, you get very excited, and I think he's a young patient. Yeah, I would offer surgery. Um, you know, you still... You, you try to withhold your excitement a little bit based on what Nizar said, but... That's what we have to offer. Would you do it open or laparoscopically? I would do it open. Uh, there's probably likely going to be a fairly heavy reaction after all that regression. And the short-term benefit of a minimally invasive approach, I think, is heavily outweighed by wanting to do as thorough and careful job as possible. So I'd do it open. So does anyone disagree with the idea of doing surgery at this point? Dr. Karam, would you do it open or laparoscopically? Do it open. So you wouldn't break out the robot. Okay. So the patient underwent a right radical nephrectomy with RPL and D. The pathology demonstrated no evidence of viable tumor. The patient had some chylosocytes postoperatively. Chylosocytes just means leakage of lymphatic fluid into the abdomen. Um, it was managed conservatively. I won't go into details about that. So assuming the postoperative studies are negative for evidence of recurrence, Eric, what would you recommend at that point? Yeah, so obviously the, the textbook on this has not been written yet, so the temptation would be to then give some consolidative treatment. You had a really nice response before with this therapy. You worry about cells that are lurking, so maybe giving similar therapies for several cycles afterwards to make sure that any residual cells are killed um, is attractive again, but it's not based on, on large amounts of evidence. So you, you, but you're saying you'd recommend adjuvant therapy? Yes. Okay, and how many cycles? Four. And that number comes from um, th thin air? <laughs> Medicine is an art, not a science. Um, Dr. Tanir, what would you recommend? Yeah, we, we followed up on this patient with more chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, he was eager to go back to work and life. And uh, he wants to go back actually to, uh, you said he was from, he graduated from Yale, so he was living in Connecticut. So we stopped. So we gave him five before, five after. So he's finished his chemo. The latest scans when we saw him were negative, so we wish him well. But uh, I think, uh, you know, we are nervous. Uh, he is nervous. His family is nervous about, you know, they, they're, they're willing to continue chemotherapy indefinitely. But I told them, you know, at this point, we need to balance uh, benefit 
There is no clear evidence that continuing beyond what we did is beneficial and probably going to be just in giving him toxicity. So we, st we stopped. So I hope he will be another uh, uh, long-term survivor like, you know, Herman, uh, Cora's brother. Okay, let's move on. Um, this is a 39-year-old white male who presented initially with gross hematuria. He had no significant past medical or past surgical history. He underwent a hand-assisted laparoscopic right radical nephrectomy at an outside institution. You can see his pathology is stage 3 with evidence of renal sinus invasion, Furman's grade 4. The Furman's grade just refers to how aggressive the cells look like under the microscope on a scale of 1 to 4, 1 being good, 4 being bad. His is a 4. He also has evidence of extensive necrosis and lymphovascular invasion, meaning that they see cancer cells inside the lymphatics and the blood vessels of the tumor, suggesting that the cells are trying to leave. So the patient presents to MD Anderson for a discussion of adjuvant therapy postoperatively. Dr. Karam, patient presents in your clinic and wants a discussion of adjuvant therapy postoperatively. What would you recommend? Uh, here we don't have any open trials for adjuvant therapy. There is one that is open. Um, nationally, the Everest trial using uh, Everolimus versus placebo for uh, such a scenario. The patient should qualify for the trial given the high grade and stage of the tumor, so I would tell them there are trials that are open here, but we don't have them at MD Anderson at this point. We did have the short trial that you mentioned, the uh, Sunitinib versus Serafina versus placebo, which is closed, and we did have the Pazopinib trial, and that has uh, closed to accrual at, uh, at present. But one thing before deciding on the trial as well as I would like to restage him if that hasn't been done yet, just to be sure the patient's free of disease. Okay, but in the absence of a clinical trial, if for some reason this patient wants to stay with you, what would you recommend? Just observation with imaging and laboratory studies. So you, even if he wanted to be treated, you wouldn't recommend any treatment? No. Okay. Does anyone differ with that? Wow, everyone's in agreement today. Okay. So patient undergoes uh, repeat baseline staging evaluation after his surgery. It's now six weeks out. And we see evidence of something going on here and something going on here. So, um, Dr. Mateen, you can see the scans. What would you recommend based on those scans? So what uh, Dr. Wood is pointing out is what appears to be some enlarged lymph nodes. Their number and size of them indicates that they're likely to be metastatic disease from the patient's uh, kidney cancer. And so uh, usually with clear cell renal cell carcinoma, if there's cancer in the lymph nodes, it's a sign that the disease is probably metastatic elsewhere also. It's rarely just in the lymph nodes. Um, the rare situation being if there's a single lymph node and it's not very large. And um, Point being, <clears throat> it'd be important for the patient to understand that even though we see these discrete areas going in and removing them, which would be a fairly moderately aggressive operation, it is unlikely to render him without disease for any period of time. So my, my approach for these is, and notwithstanding some of the work that's been done with lymph node removal on this, and, and you've done a large part of it, you know, my, my uh, inclination is to get one of the medical oncologists involved and to figure out a strategy where we combine treatments. Surgery may be as part of the plan, but I would not be eager to have surgery be the initial part of the plan. All right, well, we just happen to have some medical oncologists here, so let's get them involved. JJ, what would you recommend for this patient? So, um, of course, I will discuss with, uh, with one of you surgeons um, to see you know, whether surgery is an option. Uh, if we agree, that um, you know, surgery at this short interval after the last surgery is not a good option. Uh, certainly, we can we can start this patient on some uh, target agents such as sutin or pozolpinib, and uh, if the patient has good response, uh, we can discuss about uh, further surgery again. So you would recommend upfront systemic therapy followed by surgery? Is that what you're saying? No, I, uh, I mean, it really depends upon if, if you guys want to do surgery, uh, of course, you know, surgery is an option. However, if we all agree that surgery is not a good option at this time, certainly this patient can be treated with some target agents. All right, well, let's just say surgery clearly is an option. I mean, that's, that would be not a difficult RPLND 
Would you prefer to do the lymph node dissection first, or would you prefer to give systemic therapy first? Which would you prefer? Patient sitting right in front of you. Whatever you say, Doc. Um, well, I mean, first of all, uh, we need to restage the patients to make sure there is no disease elsewhere. Okay, so they've got a CT of the chest, an MRI of the brain, and a bone scan, all of which are negative. Uh, in that case, I think it's not unreasonable to treat the patients first. Uh, with what? With, uh, you know, either sutin or pazolpine. So you would recommend systemic therapy first? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. Eric, what do you think? What would you do? Yeah, well, since I'm a medical oncologist and I can't operate, uh, <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, you could, you could argue that in this individual, we actually have some, some pretty exciting trials. This is metastatic disease. This patient would be eligible for the uh, checkpoint 214 study, I believe, because this is clear cell. The patient has metastatic disease. This wouldn't be an opportunity for this individual then to try a trial that randomizes individuals between upfront sunitinib versus uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab. I would offer that to the patient, and we could then treat. Uh, and if we have a good response or we have some minimal residual disease at some point in time, this does not preclude consolidative surgery later on. I notice no one's recommended a biopsy. Would anybody biopsy these nodes before doing anything, or is that an option? Yeah, Chris, or? I was going to ask you, you uh, uh, this patient had surgery elsewhere. Do we have the scans from when he had the surgery at baseline before the nephrectomy? We don't. Did these nodes, were, there was a hint of these nodes being there? Uh, in other words, he had already locally advanced disease with nodal metastasis, and these things just grew a little bit postoperatively. It's not like he didn't have them, and now they, he has metastasis. Right, I agree. Uh, we don't have those films, but I, that would be my assessment of this, that they, it's not like there were nothing there, and then all of a sudden they grew. I, you know, in regard to your question about biopsy, I usually leave it up to the medical oncologists. I, I can't really tell when they want it and when they, won't, when they don't. But I have stranger things, seen stranger things happen. So where we think it's disease and we biopsy and we find something else or just inflammation. So I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Eric, did you biopsy it or no? Would you treat without biopsy, I guess is the question. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's reasonable, reasonable to say this is the first, how many, how many weeks after six this? Six weeks. Six weeks. It, it would be reasonable to do one other scan to see what direction these things are going. You know, are they, are they getting a little bit bigger? Are they getting a bit smaller? I really would need to defer to my surgical colleagues whether or not this could be reactive. You know, Serena made the comment, oh, this doesn't look like reactive. This looks like metastatic disease. But I think it'd be reasonable to, to wait a little bit, make sure that we are moving in the right, in the wrong, well, in the right or wrong direction here. Um, and if we're quite concerned that this is metastatic disease, if it's growing, if they're increasing in size, I don't think you need to biopsy. Um, if they decrease in size, again, I think you don't need to biopsy because it could be reactive. So when you say wait a little bit, what do you mean by that? Another six to eight weeks. So wait another six to eight weeks and then re-image. And if those show enlargement of the nodes, you wouldn't recommend a biopsy to start treatment. If it shows anything other than that, you would just observe. At the moment, yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Karam, what are your thoughts? So if this is truly newly metastatic disease that popped in a matter of six weeks, I mean, that would make me nervous to go directly and do an operation on this patient. I would definitely wait a little bit before deciding on that. So I agree with Eric, you know, scan at about six to eight weeks and see how the tumor is behaving. If the tumor is rapidly growing in that six-week period, I don't think surgeries should be the next best step. I think you might benefit from uh, systemic therapy first, and then if the patient remains free of disease elsewhere, then do consolidative surgery. So you're advocating waiting six to eight weeks, getting another set of scans to see which direction these nodes are going. Yeah, and to check the other areas as well to make sure the liver, you know, pancreas, all those other places are fine too. Okay. Nazar, what are your thoughts? I would get the scans from uh, baseline, from the other hospital. If there was a hint that these were there, then he had already to begin with uh, nodal metastasis, and they just grew a little bit. And if he's fit and is, um, you know, willing to have surgery, I would not do a biopsy. I would send him uh, to one of you guys for RPLND, rendering him an ED, then follow him postoperatively. And if he has then metastatic disease, then we will offer him treatment on the immune checkpoint uh, phase three trial. So I'd like to point something out for the audience. Do you notice that the medical oncologists are recommending surgery and the surgeons are recommending systemic therapy? <laughs> 
Very good. Actually, there is. A, can I uh, make a comment yeah. as yeah. well? So, if uh, you know, after rescanning, after, uh, and we decided this is, uh, uh, this is clear cell uh, metastasis. You know, this guy is only um, 39 years old. You know, it's not unreasonable to to offer him high dose IL-2 therapy at least. You know, for um, you know, at least send, send him to the melanoma department as we do here for an evaluation of that. Because if he responds well to high dose IL-2 therapy, uh, maybe there is a cure for him. Would that be your first choice, high dose IL-2? Uh, after much discussion, you know, if we ag agree this is metastasis, this is, um, this is uh, <coughs> clear cell carcinoma, I would, that would be my first recommendation. Of course, in the meantime, you know, he can also be a clinical trial candidate. Mm -hmm. so, so the comment I would make to that is, although the data are retrospective, looking at what UCLA and other places have uh, determined intra-abdominal lymphadenopathy from renal cell carcinoma is one of the negative predictors for benefit to IL-2. So I'd be a little concerned about IL-2 being one of the top options. It doesn't mean that this patient wouldn't respond, but it has been associated with uh, less, uh, lower likelihood of response. Chris, I just I want to add that if he did not have metastatic disease elsewhere, I think this patient can have a good, durable, uh, disease-free uh, survival with just RPLND surgery. I've had many of those patients, uh, you know, clear cell or papillary. Uh, and I think, you know, you, I, I think you said clear cell is the pathology? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, clear cell will be associated with a much higher uh, incidence of uh, relapse uh, post RPLND, but I think, you know, uh, papillary, especially that we do not have effective therapy for uh, these, these non-clear cell histologies, I think surgery remains an option. Uh, and I w it would be my first option in this patient. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't fully agree with that. <clears throat> I mean, I, there definitely is a difference between papillary and clear cell. Papillary, when it goes in the lymph nodes, it just likes to stay there. And what we've done when we looked at our data, there's about a 60% five-year survival in patients who have lymph node metastatic disease that's removed by surgery. Um, and, and so as long as there's no other metastases anywhere else. Clear cell does not even get close to those numbers. And the, the one lesson that we've learned with clear cell and relearned and relearned, and many times, unfortunately, over the complications of patients who've had surgery, is that we're not very likely to cure them at all with, with overly aggressive surgery. Well, when, when clear cell RCC is in the lymph nodes, it is a signal that there are likely cancer cells elsewhere hibernating. We may not be seeing them, but they're there. There's a the very rare patient who may be, we may be able to help, but we can't treat the majority based on those rare situations. So there is this agreement, and, and you know, we don't know what the right answer is, but we've gone down that road before, and so we just have to do that very carefully. So this patient was actually first seen by a medical oncologist, so obviously surgery was recommended. Um, and the patient underwent that surgery, uh, and here's the pathology. You can see that it showed evidence of metastatic renal cell carcinoma in six of 30 lymph nodes removed, um, and then postoperative changes. So, Dr. Tanier, you talked me into doing surgery. I oh, I sent surgery. them to you. What this do you want one? to do okay. now? What's that? You, be, you agreed with me, then? I... Of course. <laughs> I always agree with you. What do you want to do now? Um, I mean, I, again, we can offer him adjuvant uh, enrollment on an adjuvant trial. He will qualify. But in the absence of a clinical trial for him, I think, you know, surveillance, uh, you know, scans every three months, close surveillance, because, again, we know that these patients are at high risk of recurrence. And as Serena mentioned, you know, this is higher, much higher with clear cell than with, this, with papillary. So close, close uh, follow-up uh, if no trials are available uh, for enrollment. So scans every three months? I would. Does anyone disagree with that? Okay, so interestingly, I don't, I don't think, yeah, there's no So what, can you give us a follow-up? What's that? Can you give us a follow-up? Yes, I can. So I actually, uh, we did the surgery. The patient remained disease-free for two years, and then at the two-year mark, he, so when we did the node dissection, we removed the nodes next to the vena cava, under the vena cava, in between the vena cava and the aorta, 
and also the nodes underneath the aorta. So the only nodes that we left behind were the nodes that were on the um, left side of the aorta. He went, did well for two years and then developed recurrence in one node on the left side of the aorta. And we took him to surgery, I think it was about six weeks ago, to resect that, and now we're going to follow him up again. Okay. So how typical, is, how typical is that situation, Chris? Oh, it's rare. I agree. I okay. agree. But, I mean, it also, the implication is that our systemic therapies are so great as well. I mean, I think that, you know, localized disease, young guy, aggressive approach, you know, we would, I wouldn't argue with giving systemic therapy first followed by, um, followed by uh, surgical resection. The only concern I would have with that approach would be that if this patient's tumor was not responsive to the systemic therapy, you could potentially be losing a, a, a window of curability uh, using your approach, which I'm not saying is wrong because you could argue maybe he isn't curable. Uh, but, you know, so I guess in a young guy like this, I'm going to swing for the fences. I would say exactly the same thing, except swinging for the, to the fence. For the fences, for me, it would mean multimodality therapy. Mm -hmm. right? okay. Anybody else have a comment? All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about this one. 43-year-old white female presents with back pain. The back pain has been increasing over the last three months. She's requiring narcotics to alleviate. She's had a 30-pound uh, weight loss. CT chest bone scan is negative. All labs within normal limits, except for an elevated alkaline phosphatase. So, um, Dr. Karam, you want to take me through this scan? What do you see? Well, based on these two pictures, as you always like to show, <laughs> one or two pictures. Stop whining. Uh, there is a lesion on the left side of the abdomen. Uh, the pictures aren't enough to tell me if it's coming from the adrenal gland or from the pancreas for all that matters or from the left kidney but whatever that lesion is it's probably invading stomach pancreas and spleen among Seems others at the kidney cancer association where do you think it's coming from well with you on the podium i don't know so that's why i'm just covering all bases <laughs> but let's assume it's a left kidney mass with invasion of the adrenal diaphragm spleen pancreas and maybe stomach as well Okay, so you see a locally advanced tumor from the left kidney involving the posterior wall of the stomach, so for, that's right here, involving the spleen, which is right here, involving the posterior musculature and ribs, which are here. Um, and here's more, again, more involvement of the spleen and also the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm right here. There's two more pictures just for you. So locally advanced tumor here, and here this is the pancreas. So it's involving the tail of the pancreas. You can see that right here. So again, just to review, possibly posterior wall, the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, the muscles of the back. Doctor, let's see, Doctor Tanier, what would you recommend for this patient and why? You know, the, the, this is a T4 disease, T4 invading surrounding structures. Prognosis is uh, same like we were talking about a patient having a metastasis to lymph nodes, that they're uh, likely to have recurrence and uh, long-term poor outcome. Same thing here, a T4 disease is associated with high recurrence. Uh, so in, in the absence of a clinical trial, and in the absence of metastatic disease, and if you or Serena or Jose say, I think we can uh, resect this, then I think, uh, if you, if you can resect it, then I think surgery is, is one option. If it is going to be, as you say, quite frequently, a big whack, and she's going to lose uh, the spleen, the, the tail of the pancreas, muscle, uh, I mean the stomach, part of the stomach, and uh, you may not render her NED with, despite all this, then I think some debulking with medications, with systemic therapy up front would be uh, the way to go, hopefully to do two things. Um, render her render her disease resectable, and second to give her uh, give us time to see how this disease is going to behave over the next say 12 weeks with systemic therapy. If she responds and there is no evidence of metastatic disease elsewhere, then I think surgery will be the next thing to do. If she does not respond and there is metastasis, then obviously we spared her to surgery. So just to summarize your view, in an ideal world, if the surgeon said yes, you'd send her for surgery. If they said no, you'd give her systemic therapy and then hope that the surgeon's reconsidered. It that. depends on what the surgeon is going to tell me is going to, uh, she's going to require. I mean, if, uh, as I said, she's going to re require all those things, splenectomy, uh, resection of the part of the pancreas, uh, then I think systemic therapy up front is necessary to try to 
uh, shrink the tumors to make it, uh, uh, you know, more resectable uh, with less morbidity postoperatively. Okay, and what systemic therapy would you choose? I think, you know, we biopsied her. This looks like clear cell. Uh, okay. And I think, you know, again, just because of the size and it's uh, locally advanced involving posterior abdominal wall and the pancreas and spleen and stomach, I suspect that she may have sarcomatoid. So I would say this is a, a clear cell RCC with sarcomatoid features. Um, what systemic therapy would you choose? Target therapy. Uh, Which one? Sunitinib. Uh, so you, would be an, uh, an option. Uh, what would you choose? Sunitinib, I mentioned it. Sunitinib, okay. Well, you kept oh. saying it's an option. Um, you happen to be sitting next to a surgeon. Perhaps that surgeon could weigh in without whining about the limited number of scans on whether or not this is resectable. Uh, I mean, it is resectable, but there's going to be a lot of organs coming out with it, so I wouldn't really go for surgery as the initial step. I would agree with Nazar. I would get uh, a biopsy first if it's clear cell. I uh, would... Um, you know, of course, my colleagues would treat the patient with targeted therapy. I don't know if I would choose sunitinib first from the data that's been published. It doesn't have as much of a primary tumor response to, compared to other agents, for example, such as exitinib or even as pezopinib. So I would choose one of those two instead. Which one would you choose? Uh, exitinib, just because of our own personal experience here. Um, the response rates were close to 45% uh, in a you know limited trial, but... Um, that's what I would go for. So suppose the insurance company, because Exidnib, as you know, is only approved in second line, suppose the insurance company said no? We'll start with Pizopinib, and then if Pizopinib fails, then we can go with Exidnib as a second line. Okay. Does if Pizopinib dis- works, then it works, and then okay. we can go with it. Does anyone disagree with that? Dr. Yonash? No, I would just add that I am concerned that this is sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma. I would be concerned that this would be the sort of individual that a surgery, even if it's technically possible, would result in rapid local regional disease regrowth. I would want a biopsy, and I would probably give this person a combination. And I'm assuming that this is going to be clear cell renal cell carcinoma with sarcomatoid features. And if that were the case, I would give a combination of uh, gemcitabine plus an anti-angiogenic agent. Just parenthetically, axitinib or Enlita is now on the NCCN compendia as a category two in the frontline setting. So it is something that insurance companies do reimburse in the frontline setting now. So a combination of gemcitabine plus exitinib or gemcitabine plus pazopinib would be what I would give. Okay, so the patient did undergo biopsy and it did demonstrate clear cell renal cell carcinoma high grade. They did not mention sarcomatoid dedifferentiation. Uh, the patient was treated with 12 weeks of neoadjuvant exitinib with a dose escalation up to 10 milligrams BID. She had some significant toxicities, including hypertension, GI symptoms, rash. There was no dose reduction or drug holidays required to manage those toxicities. They were all well managed. So here's the response. Um, Dr. Um, Param, you want to wind through these x-rays too? So using the two CT scans that Dr. Woods showing me, I could see that the tumor has regressed some. You could see the tumor, on the, especially on the right side, has moved away from the uh, spleen. It's moved away from the vessels that you could see on, a little bit on the left side of the tumor. Uh, so it looks like there has been some response and even a more obvious response in here. I still don't see any enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, liver, the, the section I'm looking at looks good. It seems to be to have moved away from the pancreas as well. Okay, so what would you recommend? Uh, surgery. So you would take it a surgery? Yep, it's 12 weeks. This is what we see that the response is gonna be probably at the maximum, if not, if it hasn't happened already. And if the patient still does not have any metastatic disease on the repeat restaging, this is what we should do. So you take the surgery, okay. And when you consented the patient, what would you consent them for? For uh, left nephrectomy and adrenalectomy and lymph node dissection and possible partial gastrectomy, splenectomy, and, part- and distal pancreatectomy. Okay. And possible colectomy. Just, it's close, but it'll be fine, but just to be more upfront. Serena, do you agree? Yeah, look, this is a great response. I mean, it may not qualify as a partial response technically, but it's still, from a surgical perspective, it's a great response. Does anyone disagree with taking this patient to surgery at this time? Is there any point in giving more therapy? A little's good, more is better? I don't think we know the timing, when is the most optimal timing for surgery. But we know if she does not have metastatic disease, as you showed, you know, um, 
there is, uh, you know, evidence to s suggest that uh, surgery is good in these patients with metastatic disease. So for people who don't have metastasis but have a T4 disease, there is even more, uh, you know, uh, stronger case to be made to do surgery at some point. So I think we demonstrated uh, her tumor is sensitive. I think uh, she's young and healthy and resectable, and she, then surgery is, is the right thing to do. So the patient was taken for surgery. They had resection of the left kidney, the left adrenal, the periaortic lymph nodes, the spleen, and a portion of the diaphragm. We were able to spare the pancreas. Uh, the patient had kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma, clear cell type with extensive necrosis and therapy-related changes, from a nuclear grade three. Invasion into the sinus adipose tissue, perinephric adipose tissue, diaphragm, and spleen. There was evidence of metastasis to, let's see, four out of 15 lymph nodes. Dr. Karam, what are your thoughts? Uh, still, the pathology is very impressive. The patient does have uh, pathological T4, and that puts the patient at stage four, basically, just the same category as metastatic patients. And uh, right now, we just need to let the patient uh, heal from surgery, and then if there is no, I don't think the patient will qualify for adjuvant trials because she's already received therapy, so I would just observe. So you would observe after surgery how frequently? At least every three months. Okay, does anyone disagree with that? So patient's post-operative course was unremarkable, discharged after seven days, she comes back to clinic six weeks post-operatively complaining of increasing abdominal pain. Her labs are within normal limits except for an alkaline phosphatase that's elevated and some anemia. CT chest, bone scan are both negative. And this is her CT scan. You don't really have to be a radiologist to realize that this probably doesn't belong here or this. So this is a classic appearance of a liver metastasis um, for this patient. She had multiple lesions present within her liver that were consistent with metastatic disease. So Dr. Gao, I call you on the phone and say, hey, look, this is what happened. What would you recommend? So this is uh, this happens in you know quite a population of patients after surgery. So uh, the theory behind this is you know uh, after removing the the tumor, you can release some tumor cells and then can cause what's called the cytokine storm, which can actually serve as uh, growth factors for for kidney cancer. So um, this is uh, clearly a metastasis. I don't think we need a biopsy to prove this. Okay. So, and, uh, so what would uh, you recommend? So uh, again, you know, um, this is a young patient. Um, so um, I know with liver uh, metastasis, high dose IO2 may be not a good option. But uh, but I at least, you know, uh, for systemic therapy, I would refer the patient for for consideration of high dose IO2. Alternatively, um, you know, uh, a target agent such as sutin or pazopinib can be used as well. So what would be your primary recommendation if I, we had to, you had to put your neck on the block, what's it going to be? Uh, really, I actually had patients like this in the past. Uh, you know, I have a 40-year-old female patient who came in once she learned about high-dose IL-2 therapy. Uh, and she has, she was, uh, she's a nurse, and she has three younger kids. She said, I will go for high-dose IL-2 therapy. So is that your recommendation? Um, You're waffling. Come on, commit. I, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Tanier, do you agree with that? I, I would uh, enroll her on an anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 trial. It's an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Okay, in the absence of that, what would you recommend? I'm very tenacious. I'm going to get her on one of those trials or come <laughs> talk to the company, to her insurance company, to allow to give it. These, these drugs are on the market. I am uh, very concerned that she did not really have a good response to uh, an anti-VEGF agent. Within six weeks, after 12 weeks of therapy with axitinib, she had uh, she developed liver metastasis. So I'm not confident. I'm not. Uh, comfortable to treat her with uh, another TKI at this point. I doubt that the mTOR inhibitors are going to uh, make any impact here in her disease. So really, in my view, her only hope is uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Suppose you're in a place where there are no clinical trials available. What would you recommend? <sighs> I mean, come on, I, commit. It's a, 
maybe then I will treat her with uh, an mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus, with the hope that uh, she may have her tumor. I mean, obviously, if we are, uh, we have access to study her uh, tumor like we were talking earlier in the morning, taking uh, the nephrectomy specimen and doing uh, uh, exome uh, sequencing or at least some target gene uh, mutational analysis, you know, whether you use the MD Anderson or the foundation one from uh, Boston. If she has a mutation in the TSC1, TSC2, mTOR pathway, any of those genes mutated, then I think she has, she has a chance of having a gratifying response to an mTOR inhibitor. So off uh, without the access to this uh, molecular characterization and absence of immune checkpoints, then I would treat her with uh, empirically with Everolimus. So Everolimus would be your choice in the absence of a clinical yes. trial. Can I add something here, Chris? By all means. So if fexitinib worked the first time on whatever at least was present at the time, why can't you try the same drug again and see if it works again the second time? I mean, you can try. It's just I think uh, it's uh, disconcerting that uh, she has an explosive disease within six weeks from therapy. Unless you believe in the notion that axitinib given only for a short period of time, you know, 12 weeks is not a uh, very long time by any stretch of the imagination. Not short, but not long. And then with the added storm of surgery, maybe we have contributed somehow with, uh, the, to the fuel and made her disease angry and progress so quickly. I mean, could not, I mean, I sort of agree with Jose. Couldn't this represent that the exidinum actually controlled this metastatic disease and it didn't progress while she was receiving that therapy and that we're actually seeing the impact of VEGF rebound? Yeah, I mean, that is, uh, uh, that's what I'm saying, basically, a short uh, time of VEGF blockade and then uh, followed by surgery may be one of the hazards of this approach of just a short time uh, followed by surgery in some patients with tumors like this having rebound, perfect storm, surgery and VHF uh, rebound of, uh, you know, after you stop the drug. I still uh, would be surprised if this lady did well with uh, the target agents, quote unquote, uh, that we have available. Dr. Uh, Yonash, what are your thoughts? So obviously a serious situation. We knew that from the beginning. This patient's disease was locally very aggressive, which means that it's going to be aggressive. Uh, she did, I think, respond quite well to the anti-angiogenic therapy. Ideally, you'd want to give her something better than what she was on before, and if there was a checkpoint trial that was available, I would certainly try to get her on that. In the absence of that, I don't think that anti reinitiating anti-angiogenic therapy would be a bad idea here. And I think she is your patient, Eric. I think that's exactly what you did. You restarted her on exitinib. Okay. So how did she do? Can we? She was restarted on exitinib, and yeah, disease Dr. disease has has stabilized for for a period of time, and now uh, now other options are being explored. Okay. Let's see. Um, Dr. Gao, 15-year-old white male presents with fever, night sweats, 20-pound weight loss, and abdominal pain. Symptoms have been progressing over the last six months. Performance status is one. There is a family history of renal cell carcinoma in the patient's grandfather. All labs are within normal limits. Chest X-ray is negative. There's the scan. What would you recommend? Uh, so just for the audience, there appears to be a lesion involving the right kidney here. Yeah, so this is a, apparently well. a, a very young patient with a right kidney mass. So. Um, uh, normally, you know, for kidney cancer that happens in younger patients, uh, normally they, they, uh, they could be clear cell, but normally they can be, uh, it's very often their uh, translocation renal cell carcinoma. So um, I think I would at least uh, biopsy this patient and see, uh, um, um, see you know, the, the, the pathology of, of the tumor. Okay. So you would recommend a biopsy? Is that what you're saying? Um, if, let me take it back. So, uh, of course, also refer the patient to surgery to see whether nephrectomy is an option. So okay, so the patient's referred to Dr. Mateen. Is surgery an option, Dr. Mateen? He has no disease anywhere else. No disease anywhere else? Yeah, do a nephrectomy. So you would just do a nephrectomy, you would not do a biopsy? Okay. 
Dr. Crom, do you agree with that? I, I don't know that the, the way the tumor looks like and the fever makes me want to be sure before I take this guy's kidney out. I would, I would do a biopsy. Just the, the fuzziness on the left side and just the location of that lesion. Um, and the fuzziness on the right side? Or on the left picture oh. of the right kidney. So, <laughs> so I, I would do a biopsy. So you do a biopsy? I, yeah, just, that just doesn't look right. Dr. Yonash, what are your thoughts? Biopsy. Dr. Tanir? So do we have blood cultures on this gentleman? This sounds like it could be an infection here, abscess. Uh, do we have, I mean, acting like now uh, New England General Medicine CPC conference here, but uh, I think it's important to know the white cells, you know, normal. urine culture. Normal. There is any infection of some sort. Uh, All normal. Blood culture is normal, urine normal. culture, mm -hmm. chest x-ray, no pneumonia, nothing. Right. Yeah, I would biopsy because I think uh, I agree with uh, Jose. Uh, this is, uh, uh, does not clear to me that this is renal, I mean, renal cell uh, cancer. Although, you know, obviously it could be Wilms. I mean, this is an age, another the tumor in this young age group will be Wilms, uh, you know, uh, lymphoma, PNET, et cetera, you know, which is a Ewing sarcoma family of tumor. But I would think that this is an infection. Uh, first, we need to make sure it's not definitely biopsy with cultures at the time of biopsy for pathology uh, before nephrectomy. If this, no, were, if this were Wilms tumor, what are the implications of doing a biopsy? No, I mean, uh, you know, you may uh, give, if it's Wilms tumor, we treat them with, depending on the histology, you, they get treated with systemic therapy first. Chemotherapy is one, and then they get surgery and then radiation. So it's a trimodality therapy for uh, this rare tumor, Wilms tumor, that's mostly in, in adolescence. But again, I uh, would want to rule out here a, an infection as this uh, abscess uh, with the fever and night sweats and, you know. Well, I've seen Wilms tumors sort of frowned upon, correct? Not really. Yeah, it is. No. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> that the, the tumor and seed the tract and, and change the stage. So it changes the stage, but I mean, the NWTS here, they don't do that. They just give the chemo and then hope it's or not hope, but assume it's Wilms, but the SIOP, they just do it the other way, I think. They just do a biopsy first on everyone. It, like you said, I agree with you, it upstages the tumor, but then they give chemotherapy knowing for sure it's Wilms. So the, for so the audience, the implication, if this patient has Wilms tumor and you do a biopsy, you change their stage, you make them more advanced, potentially you alter their prognosis. By the same token, if you just take their kidney out and it's, you're wrong and it's not Wilms tumor, then you've taken out a kidney in a 15-year-old who probably needs that kidney for the rest of his life. Now, Wilms tumor, it, it, he's not in the age, typical age group for Wilms. That's, That's the only other thing to consider. Mm -hmm. So um, no, I've seen something it. that I, I was considering. I've possible. seen it in uh, adolescents, 15, 17 sure. years of age. It's possible. You can see, very rarely see it in adults, but that's uncommon, usually much younger. So a biopsy was done, which demonstrated acute and chronic inflammation with foamy histiocytes, microabscesses, reactive stromal changes, and a biopsy culture was performed, which revealed actinomyces, which is a fungus. And the patient was treated with ciprofloxacin, metronidazole, returns completely asymptomatic. There's an MRI. Dr. Uh, Mateen. Good job. You would add it in the bucket, man. So how did he get that patient? Uh, that uh, uh, actinomyces? Uh, you tell me. Uh, Anybody have any comments? What would you do? Would you do anything? Especially in the kidney. That's, yeah. a, great a great case. Yeah, I, I would uh, write a case report. All right, everyone hanging in there? Getting tired or no? We're good? All right, we'll keep going. So this is a 46-year-old Hispanic female who presented with vague abdominal complaints. She had no previous surgery. She's a hospital administrator. Uh, CT chest bone scan negative. Dr. Karam, would you like to whine about these films for us, please? So on the limited films that I see, uh, there is a mass present in the upper pole of the left kidney. Okay, so there's a mass present in the upper pole of the left kidney. You can see it here. And based on these limited films that no one's going to hold you to, what would you recommend? Seeing more of the films. Okay, and you've seen more of the films and they're not revealing in any way. Laboratory studies, metastatic workup. Metastatic workup is negative. Laboratory studies are within normal limits. Um. I'm, I don't know what else to look. I mean, there is no more films to look at, so I assume we can do a 
partial nephrectomy. So but you would recommend a partial nephrectomy? Would you do it open or robotically? Robotically. You would do it robotically. Okay. Dr. Mateen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's fine. Any thoughts for neoadjuvant therapy in the setting? Maybe downstage, improve your ability to do the partial or no? No. I assume she has the right kidney, correct? She does. Okay. So she underwent a robotic-assisted laparoscopic left partial nephrectomy at an outside institution. The procedure was, quote, unquote, complicated. It took them over 10 hours to uh, do the procedure. The patient was discharged at post-op day five. And then she returns on post-op day 30 with abdominal pain and hematuria. Um, Dr. Mateen, what would you recommend at this point? Yeah, so, you know, when Jose and I answered, we left a lot out because, you know, we're getting, we're getting uh, clobbered here. And, clobbered, you know, really? We're getting verbally assaulted by this <laughs> moderator. <laughs> so, he is mostly. But, um, no, look, uh, it's a difficult location. So, in terms of, a, you know, Jose and I are saying, yeah, we'll do it. But that's because we've got a lot of experience doing it, and we also know that that's a bit of a more of a tricky spot. So there's a, in the community, there, there are a lot of people starting to do robotic partials, which is in some ways good because they're doing that instead of taking out whole kidneys. But on the other hand, there may not be the realization that some cases are tougher than others. And I'm afraid that this represents one of those scenarios. Yeah, I mean, would you actually sit at a console for 10 hours, or would you? No, no, and I've, you know, I've, uh, you know, we've all learned the hard way, or sometimes the easy way, but I set time limits for myself, and we, we always tell patients, look, it, there's a chance we may convert, but if I struggle within the first hour or two, and we don't think it's, it, you know, it's going to take a while, we just convert and do it open and try to do a good job that way. Okay. But 10 hours is, is alarming. So the patient presents with abdominal pain and hematuria, what do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I would, re, I would restage her. I would get a, a, a chest x-ray at the very minimum and um, also a, a CT scan and labs. What are you looking for? Well, I'm, I'm worried about a complication, but I'm also, there's alarm bells going off about the 10-hour operation, the fact that it was, you know, complicated. I'd want to look at the operative note. Um, and so you, you, you worry about the typical things, and then in the back of your mind, you're also thinking about maybe even atypical things that you would rather not be the case, but I think it is the case here. What's the typical things? Um, you know, there may be maybe uh, like an arteriovenous fistula, um, so basically abnormal connection with the blood vessels at the time of the partial nephrectomy that might explain the blood in the urine, that might explain the abdominal pain. What you really were in the back of your head if there was tumor spread at the time of the case, and and and, and um, un in inexperienced hands, that can happen, and unfortunately, all of us here have, have seen patients refer to us in those scenarios, so I'm, I'm concerned this may be the case here. So you're going to get abdominal imaging, chest x-ray, and labs, okay? Anyone different from that? Uh, could we have the PATH report? Yeah. In a minute. In a minute. It's, it's coming. It's faxing right now as we speak. <laughs> okay, so the patient underwent imaging, and it revealed evidence of a pseudoaneurysm, which is a dilation of the blood vessel or communication between the venous and arterial systems, usually caused by surgery, uh, partial nephrectomy. So how would you treat this? Yeah, so uh, they're right there doing angio, so they, what they can do is thread a little thing up there and basically embolize um, that area. Um, and in almost all cases, they're able to control it that way and, and stop the bleeding and still save the kidney. So it's actually quite rare that for bleeding to have to take one of these patients back. Typically, the interventional radiologists, they've gotten so good that virtually all these problems with bleeding after surgery, unless it's, you know, emergent and life-threatening, they can manage uh, with uh, interventional radiology and avoid having to go back to surgery. So patient undergoes embolization. Uh, Eric, there's your pathology report, T1B, clear cell, Furman's grade 2, margins negative, although if you read the fine print, the gross report says that the specimen was received in five pieces, and initial post-operative imaging is performed. Here's your limited imaging. Dr. Tanir, what are your thoughts? So the concern is uh, whether she has, because of the uh, uh, piecemeal uh, surgery that there is uh, tumor uh, spillage and uh, concern about pot potential local recurrence in the left remnant, uh, the, in the left renal remnant. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend? I 
I think it is, uh, she probably is going to end up with, uh, I'm going to send, send her back to, this, uh, to you or to Ozia uh, and Serena. Uh, she may end up having to have a uh, nephrectomy. Uh, so are you advocating doing a nephrectomy now or what? No, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that she has recurrence because of the uh, surgical mishap and that there is tumor in the uh, kidney. Uh, you could uh, follow her after the embolization, you know, uh, six weeks later, two or three months later, see what happens post embolization. If the bleeding stop, get, get another set of scan. Uh, I wouldn't rush into surgery because she doesn't have metastatic disease, you but would, I am concerned. Sorry, you would rush or you would not rush? I would not rush because okay. you already, uh, the IR uh, physician did selective embolization, stopped the bleeding. I would get another set of scan, uh, but uh, soon after uh, the embolization, maybe six weeks. Six, so you'd wait six weeks and get another set of scans? I would, uh, but I am concerned, as I said, that uh, she may have recurrence uh, in the kidney because of the surgical mishap. Okay. Dr. Uh, Karam, what would you recommend for this patient? I would definitely wait. I would not take this patient back to surgery. I think that's probably the worst thing we can do at this point is make a bad situation worse. Uh, I would scan the patient every three months. And even if I see something that's even suspicious, I want to see how that develops over time. So if I see a one centimeter or half a centimeter lesion in the kidney or around the kidney, I wouldn't necessarily rush the patient to surgery right away. I would wait because probably there's going to be more things that will develop over time. So that way you can wait until all that is mature, and then you can go and do surgery to clean out that whole area. Okay, so you're saying wait and wait for evidence of recurrence, and even at that recurrence, not necessarily jump in with both feet, just continue to observe it to let it declare its biology, is that what you're saying? Yeah, for a short time after we declare that there is now, we're sure there is a recurrence, I would um, you know, be more careful and keep watching and then decide at that time if we should go back to surgery or not. Okay, anyone disagree with that plan? No one would go in right now and do an nephrectomy? Yep. Okay, fair enough. So observation was recommended. The patient returns in six months with repeat imaging. CT chest is within normal limits. Patient has no complaints. Dr. Karam, six months have passed. There's your CT scan. You can see that there's subtle evidence of something growing right there, basically in the same spot that the old tumor was. What do you recommend and why? So uh, I assume this is the only lesion that we see in the... You assume correctly. Okay. So this looks like a two centimeter recurrence at the area, like you said, of the old tumor. So this is tumor that basically is residual that has had the chance to grow. And this had grown relatively quickly in that six month period. I mean, the options would be number one, to observe, which I don't recommend at this point. It looks like it's already grown big enough. And then we've had six months to watch it. Number two would be to do ablation therapy which should be relatively easy to access because of the posterior location. And uh, number three would be to do surgery, which could be either an attempt, attempted partial nephrectomy with a high possibility of doing a radical or just a straight radical nephrectomy. So what would you recommend? Ablation. You would recommend ablation? Yeah. Radio frequency or cryo? I would let the radiologist choose, honestly, but I think both are equally effective in this specific size and location. It's far from the hilum. It's not close to the collecting system, so either would be just fine. Okay. Dr. Mateen, what do you recommend? Yeah, I like the idea of ablation only because I'm still worried about microscopic disease elsewhere, mm -hmm. and I think this we see first only probably because it was the larger piece that was left behind. So at least with ablation, you haven't burned any bridges. You can still treat what you see, but still able to observe the rest of the abdomen and make sure that nothing pops up there. I think it's okay to wait a little while longer just to see if anything develops, but otherwise I think it's okay to pull the trigger. So yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, basically agree with Jose. I, I think it's fine if the patient really just wants surgery done, but there's gonna have to be an understanding that it's gonna be a higher risk operation. It's gonna be very scarred. Uh, the spleen is right there, could be at risk. Um, it may not be possible to salvage the kidney. I think it probably could. But, you know, the risk of bleeding and things like that would be a little bit higher. Aren't so, you concerned? I mean, so you, uh, the, one of the points you brought up is that things are going to be really socked in, which I agree with. Aren't you concerned with radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation that you, but there's a significantly high potential for injuring the spleen? 
Um, it's close. Or inadequately treating the tumor? Yeah, no, I think in good hands it should be okay. There's enough of a margin there where you could still treat the margin and, and spare the spleen. A little extra burn on the surface of the spleen wouldn't be, shouldn't be a big deal. Um, and then in terms of, it, it shouldn't really make subsequent surgery that much more difficult. We've got a fair amount of experience with that, and if the treatment is done percutaneously, you do get a reaction, but you really get that reaction just localized to the area of the tumor. Anyone differ on that? No one would recommend upfront surgery? I mean, would, you, you know, talking to the patient, uh, obviously it's a very important, uh, uh, you know, thing we need to do. And you give her an options, you could do RFA or cryo or partial or radical. I think, you know, the, the patient is going to have uh, to weigh in also what she prefers. Having had that bad complication happen and the mishap, you know, initially, uh, bleeding and aneurysm, etc., and now recurrence of the tumor because of uh, inadequate surgery up front. So my, if she was my wife, uh, my sister, I would probably say, you know, if uh, it would be best to do the redo or completion nephrectomy, we'll do a completion nephrectomy rather than RFA and a potential. I've seen, they don't, they're not, luckily they're not common, they're rare, but I've seen so many complications with RFA and cryo uh, that I'm... Really? You yeah. have? Yes. I, I mean, not that I've done them, other people have done them, but I've seen them. Uh, and in, you know, those are the ones that you remember. I mean, if there are only three cases, uh, and you remember those three cases vividly, then I think uh, the option of RFA cryo would be uh, the lowest on my list of uh, uh, recommendations, and I would do a, a, a completion nephrectomy in this lady. So, Jose, you looked at our data with, with radiofrequency ablation a few years ago. Do you remember roughly what the complication outcomes were? Uh, I mean, the major complications were quite minimal. I, I know the cases that Nazar is talking about, and that's pretty much it. I mean, the three to four cases. So we looked at our how many? 150. So the major complication rate requiring further procedures is typically less than 5%. So it's really unusual. But when they do happen, they are memorable. Uh, but the same thing could happen with surgery as well. So surgery is not without its own complications. And um, I think it all comes down to patient selection. This tumor is posterior, it's far from the hilum, it is close to the spleen, but I think the chance of any major complications such as injury to the whole kidney or to the spleen or to the colon is extremely low in this scenario. So I think this is a good patient for ablation if the patient chooses to do so. So again, I want to point out the irony. The surgeons are saying don't do surgery and the medical oncologists are saying do surgery. <laughs> Uh, we actually took the patient to surgery for an attempted partial nephrectomy. Everything was stuck to everything. We actually ended up having to resect a portion of the diaphragm. Uh, she kept her spleen, but we did end up uh, doing a radical nephrectomy because partial wasn't possible. So All right. can you tell us why didn't you uh, do what your colleagues uh, You know, quite honestly, I have the sort of same attitude as you do, and I vaguely remember talking with some of the interventional radiologists, and they were concerned about getting a proper zone of ablation because of things being so scarred in from the embolization and previous surgery. Okay, um, this is a 78-year-old white female. She has an incidental renal mass that was discovered during surveillance for her breast cancer. She has a few medical problems, hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, depression. She, these are the medicines she takes, metastatic evaluation otherwise negative. Her labs are within normal limits, except she does have renal insufficiency, so normal GFR should be around 100. Hers is 50. Uh, there's the mass right here in the right kidney. Dr. Um, Tanier, what would you recommend? We can observe it. This is a small mass. She's, she has comorbid illnesses. Uh, I think if she would qualify to be enrolled on Serena's protocol of active surveillance. Um, it, is, uh, it is likely that she may not require to have anything done for this in her lifetime, but it, we will observe her, and I think we do scans every six months and look at the rate of growth. Maybe one centimeter or less per year mm -hmm. is, is not bad, and maybe we can spare her surgery. Um, 
and again, it, we talk to the patient and see what the level of anxiety and how, whether they want to intervene or they're happy to follow this with active surveillance. So you'd recommend active surveillance? I see just a small renal mass that's uh, cortical and uh, yes, I think she's elderly, she has comorbid illnesses. I mean, you could argue that she had, did you say she had breast cancer before? Yes. You know, uh, is this a second primary? Uh, most likely it is. It's unusual to have breast cancer metastasized to just like this, cortical uh, one kidney without disease elsewhere. So it is unlikely, extremely unlikely that this is breast cancer. Um, so, so you could biopsy it if, but if I elect to offer surveillance anyway, so why biopsy? I would say this is not breast cancer, this is a renal cell, but it's small, and I would, I would follow it without a biopsy. Okay, so you'd recommend active surveillance? I would. Okay. Um, Dr. Karam, what would you recommend? I would uh, recommend active surveillance with possible delayed intervention if the tumor is growing fast. Okay. Would you do a biopsy or no? Um, I would talk to the patient about it, but I wouldn't do it. You would not do it. Okay. Dr. Mateen, what would you recommend and why? I think surveillance is fine. Do we, the, we don't have non -contra do we have non-contrast phase? Um, that, in other words, it's not an angiomyelipoma. No, it's not. It could look like that. It's so. not. Um, no, I think active surveillance is a reasonable initial option unless she was very eager to just have it out. Um, you know, the other scenario we get into these days is insurance issues. You know, patients may have insurance for a while. They're not sure what's going to happen a couple of years from now. Um, that's the one problem with surveillance is that you kind of assume that your scans are going to get paid four years down the line when this is still being surveyed. But I've had patients be in tenuous situations in that regard where they don't know if they'll have insurance a year or two from now and they just want it out and taken care of. So, you know, that's what drives patients' decisions sometimes, even though we don't like to think that it's an influence. It is. So what would you recommend? Um, no, but I think my initial suggestion would be active surveillance. Would um, you biopsy it? I do. I offer all patients biopsies. It gives us an opportunity to be informed uh, and to be proactive about any changes that occur. So but you, you I, would recommend a biopsy? I would recommend it, yeah. Okay. Eric, what do you think? Patients on warfarin, uh, I think it ends up creating a whole bunch of logistical challenges and having been there unfortunately with some of my patients where well-intentioned uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's results in other complications, I would not biopsy, I would observe. Okay. Patient was biopsied, ultimately demonstrated oncocytoma, which is a benign tumor, by the way. You guys doing all right? So the implications of that are that Basically, it's a non-cancerous tumor, mm -hmm. and what we've learned from the biopsy is that we don't really, you could say she doesn't need any follow-up, but we do know that these grow. Um, truth is, even if they grow, I'm not sure we do anything unless they get really big, but mm -hmm. the risk of it becoming metastatic or causing the patient harm is really quite low. So in those cases, I still follow them, but I follow them much less intensively. Right. Okay. A uh, 59-year-old white male presents with a palpable abdominal mass, no urologic symptoms, performance status zero, eight-pound weight loss over the last three months, all labs are normal, MRI of the brain is negative, bone scan is negative. So here's a locally advanced tumor involving the left kidney. Again, involving maybe the posterior psoas muscle, possibly. And evidence of disease in the lungs. So um, just go down the line. I want a yes or no. I don't want a speech. I don't want philosophizing. Would you offer this patient cytoreductive nephrectomy? What's the performance status? Zero. Zero. Eric, yes or no? Three. You would offer three, okay. Uh, Serena? Yes. Yes, number one, okay. Karam? Yes, I would have done three if it was on a clinical trial, but off trial, I would go for surgery. Okay, so you would only in the context of a clinical trial would you consider pre-surgical therapy? Because I think he's resectable at this point, so. Okay, all right. Nazar? One, yes. Okay, and? Kidney? Yes. Yes. So we have one pre-surgical and everyone else says take the kidney out. And um, Eric, just to clarify, would you do pre-surgical even if you didn't have a clinical trial or would you put him on a clinical trial? Yeah, I think this is a case where you 
perhaps would end up making the surgery a little bit less challenging, and we've got pretty good evidence that you can shrink it down. So I, I see very little downside to choosing three. So the patient was enrolled in the Sinitinib pre-surgical trial. He had a biopsy of his lung lesion, which demonstrated metastatic clear cell kidney cancer. He received two courses of Sinitinib and then was referred for surgery. Here's the response. Still maybe a little bit of invasion of the psoas muscle, but overall fairly satisfying response within the primary tumor with regards to central necrosis, not a lot of shrinkage of the primary tumor. And the lung disease basically looks relatively stable, certainly no dramatic regression, no dramatic progression. Um, so let's go down the other way. JJ, what would you recommend? Uh, so in this setting, uh, you can you can do two options. One, uh, apparently you can continue to treat the patient, but the patient didn't respond that much in the primary tumor. Uh, it's also reasonable to uh, watch the patient. So what would you recommend? So, um, you know, often if a patient is on, uh, already on a, a TKI, uh, such as sunitinib, if, uh, if you stop the treatment, you can have this rebound phenomenon. Okay. So uh, in that case, tumor, tumors can grow very rapidly. Okay. So what so would you recommend? I would, uh, I would recommend continuous sunitinib. So you'd say continue sunitinib. Okay. Um, Dr. Tanir, what would you recommend? So, I mean, since the patient is already, already enrolled on a clinical trial, and the trial, uh, if I recall, does, uh, uh, you know, encourage patients to stay on trial, and if they have stable disease like this gentleman has, or if they had uh, a better response, more tumor shrinkage, then they'll go for their cytoreductive nephrectomy and then resume uh, their systemic therapy with sinitinib postoperatively. So I think to follow the, the spirit of trial, the patient enrolled on the trial with the hope that uh, we learn something. Uh, and I think uh, the patient uh, e e and we behooves us all to follow the spiritual trial and go with uh, two, option number okay, two. So you choose two. Okay, Jose? Yeah. Just number two. Number two. Sit around. So f today I would offer uh, actually um, six, it's two or six is fine. Two, three months from now when we have our immunoablation trial, the patient would actually be a candidate for that and I would talk to him about it. And what that would entail is ablation of one of the lung tumors, one of the lung lesions, starting CTLA-4 or being, yeah, starting CTLA-4 and then doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy three months later. Okay. So the overall assessment of the d <coughs> disease was, pro pro I, I didn't think you'd say much different. <coughs> overall assessment was progression of disease in both the lung and primary, but still an excellent performance status. And as part of the protocol, he was taken to the operating room for cytoreductive nephrectomy. Here's his pathology. Locally advanced tumor, nuclear grade three, invasive into the renal vein, renal sinus, perinephric adipose tissue. We found a, di a nodule on the diaphragm which revealed metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And also we took out a right adrenal mass. I don't think I showed that. Which showed, hold on, let me go back. There yeah, there was a small mass here. Okay. So did you take both adrenal glands? No, we left the left adrenal. Okay. Um, actually, no, it says, it, I think we took the mass out of the adrenal and left the right adrenal. That's what it was, because the adrenal gland was present in the left. So postoperatively, the patient had a superficial wound infection a psoas abscess that required drainage and antibiotics. Unfortunately, as a consequence of cytoreductive nephrectomy and the complications associated with it, systemic therapy was delayed by four months. His disease progressed slowly as he recovered. He was started on everolimus, and his disease was stable at last follow-up. And I'm actually happy to tell you that this patient is in this audience, and it's unbelievable to me that he's here and doing well. Congratulations. All right. All right, we'll do one more and then we'll call it, call it a day, I think. 47-year-old um, black male with supraclavicular adenopathy, so lymph nodes at, around the collarbone on the left side. Performed status one, no comorbid conditions, brain, uh, MRI brain negative, bone scan negative, Biopsy of the supraclavicular lymph node reveals type 2 papillary renal cell carcinoma. 
So here's a picture of his scans. You can see very large tumor involving the left kidney with bulky lymph nodes present in the periortic interiorotic cable space um, shown there and also evidence of disease present in the hilum of the lung. So the, these are the, this is a lung CT, and you can see there's some enlarged lymph nodes present here in the hilum. So what would you recommend? Let's go down the line. Eric, would you do an upfront site reductive nephrectomy? If so, would you do a node dissection, and how complete would it be? I would not operate on, I would not operate on this patient. I would start him on systemic therapy, and I would, papillary type 2 can have met upregulation like type 1, uh, although it's less common, I would try to get off-label cabozantinib or put the, place the patient on a clinical trial. Okay, and if you couldn't get the cabozantinib, what would be the standard of care treatment? They're really, for papillary, the standard of care is essentially uh, whatever we, you know, it would be an anti-angiogenic agent or an mTOR inhibitor, and I would probably choose an anti-angiogenic agent. I would start them on uh, sunitinib. Okay, um, Serena? Systemic therapy. Which systemic therapy would you choose? I don't know. Well, put. you know, that's what these guys do. <laughs> I mean, and you know, for papillary type two, it's, you know, we're still figuring it out. Do you have an opinion? No. Excellent. Dr. Karam, what would you do? <laughs> to give you the short version, I probably wouldn't Please operate look. on this patient. I would do, uh, I would you know, refer to, our, to my colleagues in the medical oncology for systemic therapy. So you'd refer for systemic therapy, and what, if you had to, you know, give your two cents, which you always seem to be happy to do. What would be your choice of systemic therapy? Cabozantinib, like Eric said, uh, if that is available. We know the other uh, therapies don't really work very well. Uh, from Nazar's trial, the ESPN trial, the sunitinib versus everolimus, the, result, the results aren't that different. Um, but that would be the alternative if cabozantinib or met inhibitors are not available. What would be the alternative? Sunitinib or everolimus. Okay. Which one would you choose? Sunitinib. Okay. Dr. Tanier? I agree with what's been said already. Uh, I would recommend systemic therapy. Not that we have effective uh, uh, therapies, but I think uh, uh, surgery is uh, with this patient's disease in the supraclav lymph nodes and the lungs. Uh, it's unlikely that uh, surgery is going to serve him well up front. Uh, I agree with cabozantinib, uh, and, but I would try to uh, enroll the patient on a clinical trial, and as uh, we mentioned earlier, there is a trial that we're going to open here, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, with uh, an CMET inhibitor from AstraZeneca. So I think that would be my first choice. Okay. Dr. Uh, Dow? Uh, so I think uh, cabozantinib or CMET inhibitor will be a, a reasonable option, but uh, in the meantime, I would send the patient tissue for uh, genomic sequencing, uh, just try to see whether we can figure out any uh, targetable mutations. Um, and, uh, if this patient has, you know, some targetable mutations, I would refer him to phase one, uh, the clinical trial group, uh, for possible target therapy. Okay. So let's just assume for a minute, just let's pretend, actually not, it's not pretend, it's actually real. This case is actually an old case. It was uh, the guy presented in like 2004. Okay, so 2004, we have no targeted agents of any kind. Let's come back down this way. Dr. Gao, what would you recommend in 2004? Uh, so 2004, that's... Uh, you were what, in high school? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was still in medical school at that time. Sorry. What would you recommend? Uh, but at that time, I think uh, sorafenib was not even available. It was so. Not. Um, so the only two therapies available at that time was uh, uh, IL-2 and the interferon. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it's not unreasonable to, to try interferon on, on this patient. So you would try uh, interferon. Okay. Nazar, what would you recommend? Did you say that the patient was symptomatic from his primary? Any yes, sir. Grassy materia? Yes, sir. Yeah. If he's symptomatic and we're in 2004, no trials, no system, no... <laughs> Uh, FDA approved uh, target agents, then I would uh, send him to you for surgery. Okay, Dr. Uh, Karam? Looks like you're describing the dark ages, but yes, we'll, I think at that point in 2004, without any advances, I think surgery would be the, the first option. Okay. Yeah, I remember those days. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd been in practice about three or four years, and, you know, we, we, did, we did surgery. We didn't have anything. We were just coming off of the reports of, of cytoreductive nephrectomy providing a benefit in clear cell patients. 
but we were, were riding that wave because we really had nothing else to do. I mean, that report came out in 2001, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it was soon after, so that, that's what we did. That's all, that's all patients and us really had available. So yeah, would have done surgery, but the symptoms are a good point, and that's another major driver of doing surgery. Eric, what do you think? I think back then we were getting our hands on bevacizumab uh, already yeah. for because it was approved for. I would I would uh, consider surgery, or also we were giving erlotinib, uh, which is a, uh, plus bevacizumab, which is an EGF receptor inhibitor plus a, a VEGF antibody. Okay, that, uh, so the patient actually was taken for surgery uh, and had a lymph node dissection as well as the resection of the primary tumor and then was referred over to you guys and I think uh, they start, I think you started them on something like Erlotinib, as I recall. Um, it's 2 o'clock, I think maybe, does it, first of all, do any of the patients or caregivers in the room have any questions? You have a trapped audience, I, please don't make it specific about your case, but if you have uh, any questions, uh, now would be the time to ask. Anyone? Okay, it's all clear. All right, well listen, thank you very much for attending this conference. It was our pleasure to, uh, to uh, provide this educational experience. Um, it's, a, it's really great to see a lot of you that uh, you know, have come with us on this journey. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next conference uh, next year. Special thanks to my assistant, Carol, who without her help, this would not ever happen. Thanks and have a great afternoon.